there. Welcome. Thank you for being here. I appreciate your time. If it's your first time here, I appreciate you being here. If you're back for another video, thank you so much for coming back. I hope that you find this interesting as much as I found it interesting enough to put a video out about prostechias, which I am going to be showcasing today because I currently have three of them. They are all in bloom. And what really brought this video out apart from the care, which I will discuss a little bit further down the line, but what really brought this video out was the inspiration back in the day prior to me uploading videos to YouTube was to ask why did they change the name from Encyclia to Prostechia? Because with the exception of my Prostechia radiata here, Prostechia Garciana Alba was bought as Encyclia Garciana Alba and my Prostechia cochleata variety Lancifolia was bought as Encyclia Lancifolium. And then next thing I'm going to be bringing up is that Michael McCarthy had a huge part in identifying what I had as Encyclia Lancifolium, mentioned it was a cochleata, and then mentioned that the Encyclias I was referring to were actually now Prostechias. So, <laughs> quick tangent here. I am going to take this opportunity to thank Michael McCarthy for giving me the correct ID to many of my orchids that were mislabeled. Thank you, Michael, for being such a support during the days when my collection first aired and bit by bit you told me mislabeled, misnamed, name change, etc. This is part of the inspiration for the Prostechia How's It Growing video. Thank you, Michael. You see, because once this was happening on a regular basis, as a side note, things were coming to a head with mislabeled orchids. And then when the genus was wrong, well, let's continue. <laughs> you see, when it came to the genus name change, it was at that point in time where I started to go down the rabbit holes of why names are being changed. Not how the names came about, but why they've changed this group of orchids from, let's say, Encyclia to Prostechia and then there's the other examples of Epidendrum to Coilostylus, but let's stay on topic here. I wanted to know why they changed the name from Encyclia to Prostechia, and usually <laughs> it takes me down a few links, tabs, more links, more searches. So I'm going to make it easy for you. I'm going to link a study paper, if you're interested, in the description from which I am quoting directly. What I'm going to be quoting is the summary of that study. The whole paper is super interesting and gives incredible insight to how the genus names get changed because of reasons that go down to cellular level, including if one orchid called Encyclia doesn't have crystal flavonoids in it, and then there's the other Encyclia that has crystal flavonoids in it. So based on that marker, it's not an Encyclia anymore. <laughs> and a genus change is imminent. There's also differentials in root anatomy and cell structure and all that interesting and fun stuff that influences genus name changes and things that we cannot immediately see if there isn't something that obvious in the difference of blooms from one encyclia to the other. Anyway, I quote the summary of this paper verbatim because my thoughts will not be able to ad-lib this without getting it totally wrong. I quote, in general, the anatomical data obtained here, in parentheses, the study, strongly supports the separation of prostechia and encyclia, especially the presence of flavonoid crystals in prostechia, the pattern of thickening of the cuticle and the occurrence of fiber bundles adjacent to the leaf epidermis in encyclia. <laughs> you see, that's why I'm reading the quote. <laughs> The other character variables found during this study were indistinctly distributed among the species of Prostechia, Encyclia, and Epidendrum, end of quote. Anyway, that paper is linked in the description in case you're interested because it doesn't just explain the genus name change between an Encyclia moving to be a Prostechia. It gives a wonderful insight to what they do in order to ascertain whether an orchid remains in the genus or is then segregated out of a genus or a new genus is then created to accommodate all the similarities and characteristics that then belong in that new subgenus. So now that we have that rabbit hole out of the way, let me tell you in layman's terms, my terms, <laughs> that there are still a few things that Prostechias and Encyclias have in common. And those are that they are vigorous, they are robust, 
They are reliable bloomers with pleasant, strong, fragrant blooms and happy, happy root growers. They pretty much tick all the boxes, everything that we like about orchid growing. And if you're still here with me, thank you so very, very much. Let's get into the three candidates that I have in my collection. Maybe you can see the oddball out in this grouping of three. That's the Prostechia Garciana Alba. However, upon a closer look, I want you to see the rhizomes, the growth habit of the rhizomes of the Prostechia radiata right here. Look at the length of the rhizome. Compare that with the length and the compactness of the rhizome of the Prostechia cochleata variety Lancifolia and then the bushy growth habit of the Prostechia garciana alba, which can only be attributed to a very tight growing rhizome. So you see vigor in all of them. It would appear that the Prostechia radiata is less vigorous because, well, not as bushy, but I only just got this orchid this year in 2022 as a gift from Kateba Ohide Dana Mosanu. So she is not even firing on all cylinders yet, and yet she's in bloom and she's growing new growths. And then the other two Prostechias that I have got, well, they have been with me almost four years and proving a point that every year they are not just doubling in size, but they're tripling in size. Keep that in mind if you're interested in this genus that soon you will have a specimen size orchid. And unless you are in the habit of dividing and sharing, which is wonderful, know that you will be needing to accommodate their vigor at some point in time because they go into beast mode and once they're in beast mode there is no stopping them their vigor however has a bit of a downside <laughs> pests because of their attributes they produce quite a bit of happy sap and because they are growing so fast with so many points of growth in my environment mealybugs absolutely adore these orchids no matter what stage of growth they're in whether just growing new growths or in the process of developing a sheath or flower spike luckily mealybugs are easily taken care of scale would be a difficult one to eradicate and that would cause many many more headaches but mealybugs a bit of garlic alcohol and sayonara not to be seen again until maybe the next flush of new growths spikes and blooms Another thing about the vigor of these orchids to really take into consideration is their watering requirements. The fact that they are so vigorous, they are thirsty and I'm not even touching the subject of fertilizer just yet because if you cannot fertilize during their rest period when they're actually not doing anything and that does happen even though right now it's all go 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 roots new growths and blooms during their rest period they still need watering their root system is incredibly vigorous not only is it a branching root system but if you've got five growths on the go and as is the case of my Prostechia Garciana Alba, I don't know how many growths I've got on the go in there, close to 40, I kid you not, these orchids need water, even while they're resting. They are not the kinds of orchids that dump roots, they just add on, add on, add on. If the media were to degrade, if you are growing in organic media, then of course acidity and all that will play a part and roots can be lost. However, these guys would never let you know they've lost roots because they're already working on the next root system and it's only by the time you go into the pot to freshen the media that you realize, oh, oops, something isn't quite right. The one thing though, if something is going wrong in your pot with any of these guys, they will show it to you with their pseudobulbs starting to shrivel, as is the case with my Prostechia radiata. Because she came as a division, she was pretty much rootless, starting her root nubbins, Madam insists to be blooming and Madam behind the camera insists to see the blooms. <laughs> <laughs> and well the pseudobulbs are struggling but this is a risk that you can take with prostechias because they are so robust and these pseudobulbs of my prostechia radiata have already plumped up in comparison to what they were a couple of months ago when she was starting to grow her spike and I was letting her do that because I know the genus has it in itself to be able to handle that level of stress without collapsing immediately and the root growth is now actively happening in the pot some of the roots are already doing their job and the pseudobulbs are plumping up trust me if i had panicked about the orchid going too far to the point of desiccation and stress i would have taken that spike off i would not have let her bloom 
The orchid is precious to me, seeing as she was a gift, but I was banking on the vigor and robustness of this genus to say, I can get away with letting her bloom, and if I have to interfere, I still have time, and look, I still haven't cut the spike off, and the pseudobulbs are plumping up. This is a huge credit to this genus. And that is why they need a lot of water because of the roots and the demand that they have for water because the pseudobulbs are some of the most beautiful pseudobulbs, in my opinion, the most aesthetically pleasing to the eye of all sympodial orchids. Even their protective sheaths around the pseudobulbs as they grow, they peel off cleanly. There's not even a transparent papery residue around them that you need to fiddle off a little bit more. What you see the moment you peel back those first sheaths around around the pseudobulb once they've hardened off a little bit is just amazing and my favorite pseudobulbs in my collection are those of my Prostechia cochleata variety lancifolia. But if we're at the subject of watering, let's move to fertilizing because not only do they need a lot of water even during their resting period, oh boy, when it comes to fertilizing, combined supplementing, because what I do with mine is I start to supplement just as the spring temperatures start to warm up, like early spring, because once these get going, yes, you can supplement and it's going to help and there's nothing wrong with it, but if you can get a head start and get some calcium and some magnesium as well as some seaweed into their system before the temperatures start to really warm up and then they start to produce their spikes before they start to produce new growth and it all kicks off. Calmac and seaweed into the pot. I only go by 100 parts per million, a total of which 60 parts per million is Calmac and 40 parts per million is seaweed. And seeing as that goes into the reservoir, that would be at a pH of 6.3 because I want maximum absorption to happen with the Calmag and pH rises a little bit as it goes through my pot specifically. To my understanding, so far, there has not been such a thing as over-fertilizing these orchids. So when I start with a Calmag, and once that reservoir has been absorbed, every pot gets a comprehensive flush with plain water. The cleanest water that I have is RO water. And then I fill the pot with 300 parts per million of fertilizer. And by that time, it's a month later pretty much as the temperatures aren't that warm. The orchids are just waking up. Bit by bit, it's around that time, mid to late spring, that they start to fill out their sheaths and start to form buds with the exception of my Prostechia garciana alba, which blooms much, much earlier in the season. But pretty much the fertilizer and the supplement care is exactly the same for all of them. I start a month ahead with just Calmag and seaweed, and from there on in, I do not stop with any fertilizer until probably late fall, because by that time, everything is starting to slow down. The new growths have matured, and these orchids do move into a resting phase, which again does not mean to eliminate water. My fertilizer level is 300 parts per million. No matter how big my orchid is, Garciana alba is enormous. Cochleata is, in my books, enormous, even though she occupies a smaller pot. And my radiata will be enormous, and they all get 300 parts per million. The thing is that because they absorb the reservoir so quickly, being so thirsty, they can get that two times per week, never ever omitting the flush between every filling of the reservoir. That is super important to maintain the root health at all times, so that no salts accumulate in the pot. So you can see a total of 600 parts per million per week from the moment they start growing new growths because new roots are coming now at the same time as the new growth. I'm telling you, these orchids are so much fun to grow, it's insane <laughs> because it's really like you can't overdo it with them. And that's why I have my orchids in Lekka and self-watering with the exception of Madam Beast over here that is actually in pure Akadama. My climate here in southern Spain is super dry. They really love their humidity and their water. I have a very dry climate. I hardly have any humidity. And well, water, water, water. <laughs> so instead of going with something like Lekka, this pot is a semi-hydro classic setup with holes in the back. It is filled halfway with lava rock and then the orchid is resting on a bed of Akadama and around it, I filled with Akadama as well. And you can see that I still have some leaves that haven't been hydrated properly because of her natural climbing habit 
and they didn't get enough water quickly enough as the roots were growing into the media. Like I said, if in doubt, water. <laughs> the other two are in classic Lekka and self-watering. The transition stress, out the window, non-existent. <laughs> it's just fabulous. Having a genus that just says, okay, here I am. Where are you going to put me? Let me grow. <laughs> Speaking of where I'm going to put them, light. Light is important, but let me tell you something that light isn't always a good thing when it comes to people misinterpreting it as direct sun. Now, in the winter, they can handle the direct sun. If your temperatures stay above 16 degrees Celsius, the more light that you give them, the better without burning their leaves. But if your conditions are very warm and dry, know that airflow is super, super important. They will bloom for you with lesser light, but with any other orchid, the more light that you can give them, the better the blooming will be. The more airflow you have, the more light you can give them to keep the leaves cool. However, know that the more airflow you have, the more humidity you will need so that you don't get burnt leaf tips or that your roots won't desiccate as they grow out of the new growths. And that is the problem here in my climate. Seeing as I don't have enough humidity, I've got the light, I've got warm temperatures, with a few exceptions, but you can see they're handling it pretty well. I've got airflow, I don't have humidity. And as a result of that, I have burnt leaf tips on my cochleata. Those are just unfortunate aesthetic blemishes, but you know, just to put it out there, when I speak of light and airflow, the humidity has to match to avoid the burnt leaf tips. Not to be confused with burnt leaf tips because of too much fertilizer. There's a complete difference here because these leaf tips in my climate will burn once I bring the orchids outside during late spring, early summer, where I am being blasted with warm, dry winds from jump for an extended period of time. And because they're forming their spikes, I am not misting these orchids much. I accept it as a little secondary side effect of my conditions not being 100% ideal. Now, right at the beginning of the video, if you remember, <laughs> and if you're still here with me, thank you so much. Right at the beginning, I was talking about the blooms and how they have something in common when it comes to fragrance, because all of them are fragrant. They are amazing, but they all differ a little bit in their fragrance. My Garciana Alba has an elegant talcum powder perfume. If they are exposed to brighter light, that fragrance intensifies. Cochleata has a honeysuckle and burnt molasses and a very, very intense fragrance. So if you're growing this orchid in a closed space and you happen to be in that closed space a lot, it will take over the room and some experience headaches from the intensity of the fragrance being so invasive and sugary sweet. Now, as I grow mine outside while it blooms, I have not had any issues with the power of this fragrance, but I understand where others are coming from when they talk about it being hard to bear in a closed room. In my case, it just perfumes my warm summer air and it's lovely. Absolutely love it. By contrast, the Radiata, I would say it has a fragrance similar to the Cochleata, but it is much more on the floral side and it is definitely not as intense. It has notes of sugar and honey that also round off its perfume. Each of them are amazingly fragrant in their own right, but put them together like this and it's easy to identify which one is the most fragrant and that is Cochleata. It is truly a fragrant bully. The blooms themselves, I'm not going to say that they are remarkable in their own right, but when they grow in clusters and quantity that you can then see as an orchid matures, that is when they become most striking. Personally, I am a huge fan of chartreuse cream colored blooms. They don't have to be large. I find them to be super attractive even in their small size. But when they then come with an abundance on each bloom spike, as is the case with the radiata and the cochleata, they really do put on a pretty, pretty show in their numbers.
My Garciana Alba, well, you would say she's limping behind at the moment, but this one little bloom cluster that I have is a straggler cluster. She looks sensational around February, March, when all the growth that she's currently actively growing will mature and bloom out. It's just insane. And during that time of year, February, March, to have that talcum powder fragrance that is super elegant, soft and sweet during the almost end of the winter months, it's such a welcome fragrance to have. No, however, just one reminder, if you get yourself a small cutting, the Radiata by no means is a small cutting, <laughs> but I got my Garciana Alba as a tiny little cutting and I thought, well, gee, that was generous of you. Thank you. It did not take long for that little cutting to bloom out on its first mature growth with me. <laughs> and it didn't take very long for me to take this orchid off her mount and just say, okay, enough already. In Akadama you go and water. <laughs> It's been super easy growing these orchids. It's been an absolute pleasure to grow these orchids. It makes me feel like I'm an accomplished orchid grower. So let me tell you, if you want that feeling for yourself and you don't have prostechias in your collection, I highly recommend that you get one and see what it does to your ego and how good it makes you feel when they just do what they do best and that is grow insanely well. I'm looking at the time of this video and I'm like, oh my goodness, I didn't know I could talk so much <laughs> about a genus, but here we are. This all happened because long time ago, Michael McCarthy tells me that is not an encyclia, that is a prostechia. And I was like, okay, enough already. <laughs> and here we are a couple of years later and I'm geeking out. Rabbit holes can be so much fun when it is chasing down information and getting new intel on orchids. So I really, really hope that if you've made it this far, that you enjoyed this rabbit hole. Thank you for being here as I geek out over prostechias with all their wonderful attributes. You're so appreciated. And by the way, if I've left anything out or if I did not circle back to a thought, please bring that to my attention in the comments and I can continue geeking out down there with you. <laughs> Have yourselves a beautiful day on one condition, please, that you stay safe. Take care. Bye.